but fortunately I've had 15 years to work on it. <laughs> now that's the thing the Lord may give you something, He gives it to you to work on. I appreciate Brother Monty said, especially about this education bit. Uh, the Bible says, The prophet that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. The prophet that hath a dream, let him speak a dream. What is the chaff to the wheat? But the Bible says, if a man has the truth, let him proclaim it. Let the liar proclaim his and put them alongside and see how they look. It don't make any difference. Uh, we opened our pulpit to some Mormons here last year and had them come in and let our kids ask some questions. It was very informative, very informative. We opened our classes uh, last year to a, a, a hyper-Calvinist, not a hyper-Calvinist, a hyper-dispensationalist. You know, Cooney of Stam and Bullinger and O'Hare and that bunch, the dry cleaners, they don't believe the church begins until Acts 28 and no baptism for this age and all that stuff. We bought him that. Very informative, very informative. Uh, the best thing to do is get it out of the horse's mouth, get it from the original. All right. <laughs> if you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And Acts chapter 19, let's look at verse 13. Acts 19, verse 13. Now, the thing you want to remember about a King James Bible is whenever you feel like you're being kind of left behind and missing out what's going on, just sitting around reading an old Bible, just remember the King James Bible always runs a couple of hundred years ahead of anybody. And for example, Acts chapter 19, 13, there's the name of that movie a bunch of nuts ran off to see a couple of years back. See that thing right there? Certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, see that? Acts 19, 13, that's where the word comes from, exorcist. When they made that movie called The Exorcist, you know what they did? They went back to 1611 and got them a title. That term exorcist is not found in the new Bibles. Do you know why? Because the new Bibles are not up to date. They're out of date. <laughs> if you want to get up in modern language, get you 1611, you'll be where it's at. And I'll keep on reading down there. Notice the streaker shows up in about two more verses. See, come on out about two more verses. And they fled out of the house naked and wounded. See, that's streaking. <laughs> so the whole thing's right there. Now, you know, the, the Bible, when the Bible speaks about these things, the Bible speaks about uh, devils and unclean spirits. Jesus Christ and the apostles took these things for granted. Uh, you don't find a question in the mind of the apostles, of the Lord Jesus Christ, about the existence of unclean spirits. It's only been about the last, oh, 20 or 30 years in America with a revival of Satanism and a revival of demonism and demon worship and devil worship associated with drugs that the public has become uh, supernatural again and decided maybe there are some demons. Psychiatrists have always taken for granted there aren't any. With a psychiatrist, the problem is mental or it's uh, uh, psychosomatics or something else or paramental, you know, or extrasensory or sensory, but not demons not demons. The Bible takes demons for granted. You read the New Testament, there's a discussion there of demons about every other chapter right on through. Just takes it for granted. Is any question about it? There's a vast difference between the, the attitude of Jesus Christ and the apostles toward demons and a modern psychiatrist or a modern educator. With all the trouble they're having in the public school system, I don't recall any educator uh, warning his people about demons. And yet they're all going off to see them. I bet you isn't probably a high school kid in America in the public high school that hasn't seen Rosemary's Baby or The Omen or The Exorcist. And if you didn't see them at the theater, you saw them on television when they got old in a rerun. Now, I'm going to talk to you tonight about this subject. Can you understand? You talk about this subject, why then uh, the action begins to move up. Always has. First of all, there are a variety of demons. There are a variety. That Bible speaks of deaf demons, dumb demons, suicidal demons, theological demons, seducing spirits and doctrines, doctrines, doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 2. They're theological demons, they're religious demons, they're all kinds of demons. The most religious people of Christ's day were the ones that murdered him. You know what he said about those people? He said, year of your father the devil. Those folks were demon-possessed, and they were secondary separatists. You would have caught them with the wrong haircut or the wrong piece of clothes for a million dollars. And they were the vilest people in the New Testament. 
The Bible said they're whited as sepulchers, and inside they're full of dead men's bones and all hypocrisy. All right, there's a variety. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 24. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, notice that demon possession or devil possession, as the King James calls it, and we'll talk about more about that more in a minute, as the King James calls it, is not always, uh, it, you can't always just apply it everywhere. Notice in Matthew 4, 24, that just because a man is a lunatic, that doesn't mean he's devil possessed. Look at that passage. And notice that lunatics are in a separate class from those that are possessed with devils. Those were possessed with devils and lunatic. See that? Not everybody in the insane asylum is devil possessed. Back in the dark ages, the Roman Catholic Church took for granted that everybody that was uh, insane was devil possessed. So they put them up in chains. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says comfort the feeble-minded. The Bible recognizes such a thing as psychopathic troubles or pathological troubles that aren't due to devils or demons. Yet the Catholic Church never could get it right. They never have and they never will. All through the Dark Ages they made the Jew wear a, wear a yellow star and call him a Christ killer. You're not supposed to do that with a Jew. Now they're saying he's absolved the blood of Christ, the death of Christ had nothing to do with it. That's a lie too, he did too. They never could get it right and they never will. Now you take demon-possessed people, sometimes the lunatic, sometimes the not. Sometimes that palsy is connected with the uh, uh, demons, sometimes it's not. A man can be deaf and dumb and just be deaf and dumb. He also can have a deaf demon and a dumb demon that makes him deaf and dumb. I think sometimes some Christians have a deaf and dumb demon. I mean, you have a, if you have a deaf demon, you can't hear what the preacher says. And if you have a dumb demon, you can't witness for Christ. It's dumb. You know, like a dumb animal? It doesn't mean stupid. It means your mouth shuts. You can't open your mouth. We talk about an animal being the dumb animals. We're not talking about, there's nothing stupid about a dog or a horse, you know, if you ever watch them, but they can't communicate. I think sometimes God's people have deaf and dumb demons. All right. Now turn to Luke chapter 9, 27. Sometimes you have demons that will get you to take your clothes off. Luke chapter 9, verse 27. Isn't that a strange thing there? There's a fellow coming out of the tombs, and he's got an unclean spirit. Not always coming out of the tomb with an unclean spirit. And the Bible says in Luke 9, 27, what does it say? It said, he wore no clothes. He wore no clothes. You know one of the marks of demon possession? Try to strip your body and show it off. You know what a fellow told me one time about the heathen over there in Africa, missionary? He said, you can always tell the heathen. I said, how can you tell the heathen? And he said, well, they're marked by certain characteristics. And he said, number one, he said, the heathen are always extremely religious. That's the first thing he said. And then he said, the second thing is, they like to run around naked. And he said, the third thing is, they like to make wild dances with wild music. I thought to myself, is he, is he describing a sorority dance or is he describing Africa? Demon possession will make a person take off the clothes. That man, the tombs, wore no clothes. He ran around naked. You know the first thing that God did with Adam and Eve when uh, he drove them out of the garden? He put clothes on them. That's the first thing he did. Put clothes on them. The desire to take off the clothes and strip is uh, satanic. You know why it is? Because the Bible says, we are those that rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, I don't know how, how much experience you have with demons. I haven't had a lot. But I can must confess that all the demons I've ever run into and had any encounter with were involved with uh, independent, premillennial, soul-winning, Bible-believing Baptists. <laughs> Now, maybe they just, maybe they got demon-possessed folks over in Africa and witch doctors and all this and that, but all demon-possessed folks I've run into were in local churches that believe the Word of God. Isn't that a strange thing? You know, one time down there in Pensacola, Florida, we had a lady that uh, 
uh, tried to give the deacon board a fit in various ways, in the church and everything else. And she was a very peculiar woman. When she'd sit in church and you say something funny, she'd sit there and she'd play with a little lock of her hair and she'd go. Then you say something scary and she'd go. And then you say something, you know, dramatic and she'd go. Then you say something sad and she'd go. And then one day at a deacon's meeting with about ten deacons there, she slammed her fist down the table and said, I won't pay a cent. This is my school. Bam! On that table. My, what a blessed soul. <laughs> well, she left the church after a while. I won't decide everything to do with it, but I contributed. <laughs> and uh, she left to a church and went to another church, thank goodness. And when she got over there, uh, she was another church up the road, and we didn't see her again for a couple of years. And then one day a fellow came down from Ohio to go to school our place, just a young fellow, only been saved a couple of months. And I said, now we're going to go to a church tonight. And I said, in this church is a demon-possessed woman. And I said, when you see her, I said, I want to have you point out to me where she is. And he'd never seen her before in her life. As far as that goes, he'd never been in the church before in his life. I didn't concentrate on her, try to pull any mental telepathy stuff off, you know, or extrasensory and all that bunk. I just sat down there in the seat, and the service started, and this kid looked up in the choir. He looked up like, there must have been 300 people in the building. He looked up in the choir, looked out across the church like this, and his eye ran back up in the choir, and he said, the second woman from the left in the back row. That was her. That was her. Uh, I know something is wrong today with audience America in regards to demons, fundamental audiences, by the way they react. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, you can judge people by their responses. And what he meant that was, was this. He meant that uh, you don't have time to uh, rehearse a response. And when a man is preaching, the stuff comes so fast and so thick, you don't have time to get ready for it. Wherever he catches you, that's where you are. You may just notice sometime when I preach, I'll just suddenly say something real funny right in the middle of it. I don't do that to be just, uh, you know, just for levity or just for jesting. You know why I do that? I do that to see if you're listening. You know, some fellows relax and open. When something is funny, he laughs. And when something is sad, he cries. And when something is scary, he gets scared. He's normal. But when a bunch of people come to a building all tight and ready to resist what God has for them, they're abnormal. I've seen many a pre place where I preach, and some fellow down here someplace acting like he was asleep, you know, and I turn around and blam, 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 you know, shoot down there. And then go over here and bah, 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 shoot over here. And peripheral vision, I'm watching him over here. And after I turn this way, I watch the fellow lying there like this go, act like he's asleep again. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that a lot of times. Now, I, I told you when you first came in here, there's no way to get ready for my message. There's a way in the world. Because although I've got a lot planned what I'm going to say, I may stop at any minute and just go anywhere. And there isn't any way you can get ready for it. You just have to be relaxed and just willing to listen, see? You know, when you preach up and down this country for years and years and years, you see some strange things. I'll tell you what I've seen. I was preaching a high school one time in a place called uh, Linden in central Alabama, down near Demopolis, Uniontown, Selma, right in the middle of conservative right wing. You know, those folks back there, there but they, some of those folks back there don't know World War I is over yet. And way back there in the back end of nowhere, when those little old high schools I was preaching, and when I'd say something funny, nobody would laugh. And when I'd say something that wasn't funny, everybody would just break out hysterical. I mean, I'd say something like, uh, your mothers and fathers have sold you out, your parents have sold you out, the government has sold you out. Ha, 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 ha. Big joke. There ain't nothing funny about your parents selling you out and the government selling you out. That ain't funny. And I'd say something that's really funny, they wouldn't laugh. High school kids, 400 of them, jaded, twisted, perverted. Some of you folks in this building tonight are so crooked you have to screw your socks on. <laughs> Too late to laugh now, I already said it. You're slow. <laughs> You're slow. You're slow. You know what the trouble is? It's the company you keep. 
You keep company with that boob tube day and night and day and night, and pretty soon you'll get so twisted, if you fell through a barrel of fish hooks, you wouldn't get stuck one time. <laughs> and that's how folks are. All right, they have a variety of demons. You know what I've seen? I've uh, preached many a youth camp where you get up here and look down. Here'll be some little girl back there about 15 years old, got her hand over in a boy's leg about 17, holding on his leg the whole surface, you know, just to make sure he gets the message. I mean, fundamental, independent, premillennial, soul winning, etc. demons. You know what I've seen? I've, I've been in services where there'd be a teenage couple sitting in the building somewhere who would turn to each other like this, her like this, and him like this, and they would talk solidly for 95 minutes, just as fast as they could talk. I mean, 95 minutes! You'd say something, blam! And you'd preach all for it, and you'd turn around, blam! Imitation. First time, the second time. Why, they wouldn't talk that much out of church. You know what that is? That's demons. Those bodies are just stuffed full like a turkey stuffed full of Christmas dressing. Some of you, we had a nice, sweet Catholic lady downtown today. I knew she was Catholic. I asked the person who were to ask that just to double check. But I finished preaching down there, and some dear little soul came up in front of me all the time. I was preaching, shut up, shut up, shut up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know what I said there? And some folks don't have a sense. God gave a brass monkey, you know, and all like that. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Got all through. I said, the person who was after that lady, she isn't a Catholic. And he said, you Catholic? She said, yes, and I've got my rights, this man. That woman was just crawling with him, boy. You just give her the word of God, and she just... <laughs> you know what that is? It's demons. We've got a country filled with them. All right, now what about their size? Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 5, and look at verse 13. Mark 5, 13. Now, I'm not going to try to discourage you from buying books and studying. I mean, God knows some of you need to. And you got some good books back in your bookstore on demonology. That is, you have the standards. But none of those fellows know what a demon is. Because when they begin to correct the King James Bible, they are begin to take the mind apart, and they can't find out what it is. Now, you take Mark 5, 13. Look at that thing. A bunch of those pigs run down the hill and commit hogicide there. 5, 13. <laughs> That's the first case of devil ham. And in 5, 13, they run down... <laughs> In 5.13, in 5.13, they run down that hill, and you notice in that passage there are 2,000, 2,000, see that, 2,000? You know why that is? Because of two men there. Now, when you read that account in Mark, of course, you only read about one man. But if you read the, the supplement in Matthew, you'll find there were two of them. That's Mark's style, that's Matthew's style. For example, when Jesus Christ comes back in the triumphal uh, procession and comes to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and he goes by the wayside, Mark says, there sat by the wayside blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, begging one man. But if you read Matthew, he says there were two blind men. Matthew often will tell you how many, and then Mark will deal de in detail with one. And when you find 2,000, oh... Hogs going down that thing to get drowned, you're dealing with a thousand devils out of each man. Now, hearken, my beloved brethren, how does a man have a thousand demons in him if they're any bigger than your thumb? People get some of the wildest ideas. They're fallen angels. They couldn't possibly be fallen angels. Angels as big as you are are bigger. Whatever those things are, the mighty small. Didn't you read about Mary Magdalene had seven devils? Well, if she had seven devils, and they're not as big as your leg or your torso. It isn't amazing how much light that King James Bible sheds on the commentary. These fellows are always talking about the original, the original. Well, I've talked to at least 35 men that bragged about knowing the originals, and they couldn't even get a foothold when I'm talking about. They couldn't even discuss it. Now, those things, whatever they are, they're small. Do you know why the King James Bible never translates demon? We talk about demon, demon possession, just so glibly, you know. There isn't any such thing in the Bible. The word demon doesn't occur in the Bible. It's devil. 
devils and devil. Why is that? Well, you take those old Socrates, uh, those old philosophers like Socrates and Hesiod and uh, Plato and Aristotle. You know what they taught? They taught that a demon sometimes was a good thing. As a matter of fact, all those fellows profess to have a demon. I won't argue with them. And they said that the demon was what gave them their genius. They said Alexander the Great had a demon. Had epileptic fits, claimed to be virgin born, said his father was Jupiter. Maybe he was, I don't know. When those fellows said that a demon might be good or bad, the King James translator did you a great favor. The King James translator showed you that a demon is never good. A demon is always bad. So every time the word demon came up, they translated devil. And every time the word demons came up, they translated devils. And about the time they did that, the faculty members of all these apostate fundamental schools said, why well, that can't be, there's only one devil, but many demons. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. That's the standard party line. Now, come now, let us reason together. <laughs> How many of you are sons of God? Let me see your hands. Isn't there just one son of God? You see, there is just one, but there are many sons of God. Isn't there just the angel of the Lord? Why, of course there is, but there are angels of the Lord. Isn't there just one true God? Of course there is, but the devil is the God of this world. Why wouldn't there be one devil and many devils? Folks have a time of it, don't they? Folks say, would you change one word in that King James Bible? I wouldn't touch a word in that King James Bible. The fellow was devil-possessed. Devil-possessed. Now, the new Bibles, you know what they do? They translate that thing as demons. And that isn't a translation. That's what you call a transliteration. The idea of saying the ASV is a more accurate translation. They didn't even translate it. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 5. Now let's get our theology right. Let's get a Bible understanding of this thing. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. Talking about the demon-possessed man. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. He said, Come out of the man, thou unclean what? All right, now you know where you're at. The devil is manifest throughout the universe by a spirit. And that spirit is an unclean spirit. And that unclean spirit is composed of devils. Singular, unclean spirit. That fellow had one unclean spirit. And it was composed of devils. And that made him possessed with the devil. Look at Mark chapter 5 and come on down. Mark chapter 5 and come on down. They saw him that had been possessed with the devil. What verse is that? About 16, 17? 16. See that thing right there? And folks talk about uh, demon possession. They don't know what they're talking about. That fellow was possessed of the devil. And being possessed of the devil, that fellow had an unclean spirit in him. And the unclean spirit in him was composed of devils. And that's how the King James handles the matter, and that's the right way to handle it. Now, what does a demon or devil look like? Well, we're told back over there in Revelation that three spirits came out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet, three unclean spirits, like frogs. But that ain't the general rule. The general rule is those things have to have wings. That's why I'm drawing them with the wings. Turn to Mark chapter 4, and in Mark chapter 4, look at verse 4 and verse 15. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a textbook printed by Moody Baker as honor of him. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 4, verse 15. Now you understand that uh, what I'm giving you right now, if this, you pass this on to some of the brethren, you'll be called a heretic. And the reason why you'd be called a heretic is because they're a stupid dick. <laughs> and they don't read their Bible and don't believe their Bible when they read it. Now Mark chapter 4, verse 4, the parable of the sower and the seed. The sower sows the word of God. 
And what happens? The fowls of the air come down and get it, right? What are those fowls of the air? Look at verse 15. Don't you say that's Pete Ruckman's teaching? That's the Bible. Did Jesus Christ told you that? One time isn't enough for you? All right, turn to Luke. Pick up Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 5. We're not talking about some strange novel teaching and some non-fundamental hobby horse. You're talking about the words of Jesus Christ. Paul says, if any man consent not to sound words and wholesome doctrine, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Parable of the sower and the seed. The fowls come down. And the fowls come down and stew that word. And what do those fowls represent? Look at verse 12. Luke 8, verse 12. What is it? It's the devil, man. They're birds. Now, did you ever hear a fellow call a fellow bird brain? <laughs> I mean, the Germans say, Er hat ein Vogel. You know. Say the fellow's crazy that he does this. See? They say, bats in the belfry. You see? And some of you watch Hitchcock birds just like you thought you were watching a real original production or something. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Get your Bible. Get caught up with it. Jonathan Seagull. <laughs> Bless his heart. The bird man of Alcatraz. Strictly for the birds. Bird watchers. See what that stuff is? Those things have wings. You doubt it? Turn to Matthew chapter 12. If you don't say it ten times, he won't say it once. He'll say it till you get it one way or another. Matthew chapter 12. The original languages never end. They never, they never, they enter the equation one time. Folks say, well, if they don't, how come you teach Hebrew and Greek down at your school? We teach Hebrew and Greek down at the school. I didn't know. We're teaching Spanish and German this year. We may wind up a Pentecostal uh, gift tongue down there before we get through. <laughs> Have them stand up talking in Spanish and German and Hebrew and Greek and English. You say, why do you teach them that stuff? We teach them that stuff so when they run up against some smart aleck who thinks he's smart enough to correct the Bible, they can, you know, hitch his wagon up and drive it. <laughs> and we got some boys that can. Not all of them can. We don't bat a thousand. We turn out some yo-yos down there. If you had Bob Jones bring his quartet and his brass band in here, you know, his brass group and you know, and his pretty little girls, you know, to sing for you, he wouldn't tell you they have some yo-yos there, but they do. <laughs> Lauren, 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 Lauren. <laughs> you pastors, you pastors here, don't ever take anybody from my school because he says he's from my school. Don't ever do it. Don't ever do it. Some guy come to my school, come around wanting to help as a missionary, a recommendation for something. Don't you ever make the mistake and think, well, he must have been, he'd been to Pete Ruckman's school, so it must be all right. No, sir, brother. You write me. Write me. I know my boys. I know them. I know what they can do and what they can't do. You see, at my school, I'm not the promoter, the front man that gathers the money that turns the kids over to faculty. I am the teacher. I've been in my school for three years. I've looked him right straight in the face in 22 different subjects for three years. 22 subjects. I know what the guy can do. And I know what he can't do. Don't you ever take him blind on me. We, got, we, don't, we don't buy a thousand. This brother talking about coming to Chicago to work, you know. I must confess, brother, I about come to the conclusion that no good thing can come out of Chicago. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you something. All the girls, all the girls we got from Chicago were real fine girls. Um, we got a bunch of single girls down there. They were big girls and healthy girls, and they loved the Lord and believed the book, and they're hard workers, and they made their own living, and paid the bills, and made good grades. But, boy, the male material we got in that city is something else, brother. It is something else. I've never seen such a bunch of kooky kooks in all my life, man. Good night. I think I... Out of seven young men came to Chicago. I think we got two out of seven, something like that. I mean, weird, man, weird. Could come around. I don't know whether I'm being possessed or not. You know, I think I must be because I threw a cup up in the air the other day and the spoon didn't fall out of it, you know. <laughs> what a, 
I mean, what, what, a, what a revival we're going to have with that. <laughs> All right, now, if they come around from my school, uh, write me a letter and say, I've got a guy up here named so-and-so. What about him? What kind of fellow he is? I know him. I know him. All right, keep on reading here. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. Ecclesiastes 10, 20. Ecclesiastes 10, 20. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, talking there, and it says, uh, Money answers all things. And then he says, Curse not the king, no, not in thy bedchamber. Keep on reading. That which hath wings shall tell of the matter. See that? What that says? That says you husband and wife better watch what you talk about in your bedroom at night. Because you get talking back and forth and there's something in that room that knows what you're saying. And it can leave that room. And fly off and say, hey, put it down over there. How's that for what? You doubt it? Turn to Matthew chapter 12. If he don't say it ten times, he won't say it once. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. They're talking to Jesus Christ. They call him Beelzebub. You know what Beelzebub is? He's the prince of filth. You know what he is? He's Lord of the Flies. <coughs> so the little thing? You know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of what we're talking about. Probably could have a thousand of them. Did you ever see a mosquito? He's a bloodsucker. You know what those two things are types of? What we're talking about right here. You hear a buzzing in your head? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't believe it yet, do you? All right, Revelation chapter 18. If he says it once, he'll say it again and again until you get it. There is no scientific textbook except the Bible. And the Bible is the final scientific textbook for all authority, and that's it. But nothing any psychiatrist can tell you about devils or demons that God didn't tell you about 300 years before his mother was born. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, talking about Babylon the Great. What does he say? He says, come out of my people. And he says, she's become the whole of every foul and unclean spirit and every hateful bird. Isn't that what he said there? You remember when you read that list in Isaiah chapter 34 the other night? Remember you saw me sitting right here and we went through that body, soul, and spirit thing? You turn to Isaiah 34 and you find a lake of fire and what'd you find in that lake of fire? Birds. You know what those birds are? They're listed in Leviticus 11. They're unclean birds. Now, you'd think a fellow could get that I have at home 22 sets of commentaries. Some of them run 22 volumes apiece. I have never read one commentator who knew what a demon was, including Unger and a whole bunch of them. You know why? Every one of those fellows somewhere down the line thought he was smart enough to give you a better rendition or a better translation, like the brother said, or fix this up. And when he did, the Lord just pulled the thing down on him like that, and he couldn't get any more. Why, something that, that clear, come, come, brethren, when Noah parked the ark at Mount Ararat and sent out a bird, the first one was a black one and didn't come back, and the next one was a white one and came back, and it was a dove, and tell me, what is a dove a type of? You don't have any trouble with that, do you? Birds represent spirits. How could you miss it? The dove's a type of the Holy Spirit. Then things have wings. And if that thing was a frog, it was probably a winged frog. (laughs) 
I'll put wings on him. <laughs> now, you and I are living in the great day of demon possession and demon obsession. There's no doubt in my mind, there may be some doubt in yours, but there's no doubt in my mind that this America today is filled with unclean spirits from one end to the other. There's doubt in my mind about it all. And when you hear these people go around and say, well, greater is he that is within the world, greater is he in the world, those people are full of demons. And they're trying to talk themselves out of it. You watch these guys say, greater is he than you in the world. Greatest. Now, wait a minute. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. What does that guarantee? That isn't a guarantee. That's just a statement. The fellow says, well, if Christ in me is greater than the one in the world, then I can do. No, you can't. The devil has clean you off the map unless you avail yourself of the resources. Now, I'm, I'm making myself clear. I'll be a little clearer. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen? Your body belongs to God. Amen? Amen. Okay, the devil can't get it. Amen? Amen. You're wrong. Take such a one and turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. See? These dumb Christians think because their body belongs to God and Christ is in them, they're devil-proof. You're not devil-proof. I teach a Christian can be demon-possessed. Now, when I teach that, there's a big roar from the bleachers, you know, because the dumb Christian thinks, well, if he's demon-possessed, the devil's got his soul. No, I don't mean that. I, I don't think a Christian can lose his salvation. I don't think a Christian can go to hell. I don't think the devil can ever get your soul. But do you realize how much you, the devil, could get without getting your soul? Question. If the devil got your family and your job and your mind and your imagination and your eyes and your mouth and your ears and your nose and your lips and your tongue and your heart and your bladder and your liver and your stomach and your intestines and your feet and your joy and your testimony and your health and your life, wouldn't that be a pretty good hunk? And then got your reward of the judgment seat of Christ and your millennial inheritance? Isn't that a sizable piece? You take these dumb, stupid Christians, they think when you say possession, you mean the devil can pull you off to hell. I don't mean that. I mean the devil can run you and use you every day of your life till you die if you let him. And the fact that greater is he that is you than in the world don't mean a cotton-picking thing if you don't fight. Don't give place to the devil. See that ground? Okay, I hold that ground. And I give place like that, the devil's got the ground. And I give place like this, and the devil got him some more ground. And when I come back in, he loses the ground. Why, the fact that Christ in me is greater than the devil, that isn't anything. That's just a statement. That's a truth. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything if you don't apply it. Why, the wide, well, they said to old Ananias over there in the book of Acts, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? His body was the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. His body and the spirit belong to God. Amen. What good doing? No good at all. Satan filled his heart. I believe that the devil has his way in many a life for many a Christian for a long, long time. I've always taught that, always believed that. I don't even get you to hell, but he can sure get a lot of you before you go to hell. Do you know, you know what the trouble is? Devil possession in a Christian is based upon ignorance and passivity, not upon moral character. There are some Christians that think if they just live good lives, the devil surely won't get them. That is how he gets you. Paul says, we're not ignorant of his devices. One, be not deceived. Two, let no man deceive himself. Three, let no man deceive you by any means. Those are three commandments. Those commandments are like, do not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, be filled with the Spirit. One, let no man deceive himself. Are you deceived? Let no man deceive you. Has he? Be not deceived. Are you deceived? Well, the devil's got you in those three places. You see, it's based on ignorance. It doesn't do you any good just to live a good life if you're ignorant of how the devil works. If all you do is just clean up your life, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't dance, you don't spit, you don't dip, you don't chew, you don't go with them that do, 
and you take the beer out of your icebox, you don't believe in mixed bathing, you have three-quarter length sleeves, and you don't wear any jewelry, and you got your hair cut right, your dress right, your pants right, if that's all you do, the devil probably just wipe you out and have done with you. You've got to fight. Paul said, I fought a good fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rule of the dark of this world. You know what kills a Christian? Passivity. Passivity. That's how you get an entrance for demons. You get in a passive state. You get in a passive state. You folks sitting around watching that boob tube. That old light's going across there. Flip, 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 flip. And they're showing a movie, and the, the flicker in the movie's going between those frames and the film. You're sitting there, and the first thing you know, your whole attention is riveted out here. He says, what's happening here? So the trick here is to get your attention riveted in the Word of God, then you get an infilling of the Spirit, the right Spirit. But you get that attention riveted out there like that, where you're just passive sitting like this, when the thing comes in, you don't know what it is that comes in. You take a whole lot of Christians, for the, for the most dangerous time in your life is when you decide to sell out for God. Did you know that? The most dangerous time in your life is when you want to be filled with the Spirit and have God use you. Do you know why? That's just the time a devil will counterfeit the Holy Spirit. This charismatic movement all over this country is a bunch of people that want to love God, want to serve God, want all that God has for them. And the devil comes up to them and slips them a counterfeit gift, and then they think they're charismatic and have charisma and have gifts more than anybody else, and get proud of it, and the devil just takes them off, and that's the end of them for 50 years. You name me one charismatic in this country that consistently wins people to Jesus Christ. I didn't say the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I didn't say PTL. I didn't say share God's love that consistently wins people to Jesus Christ. The devil knocks them out of the ring. Guy gets back here and alone at night. Oh my God, will I get the right spirit? I know I talk in tongues. Well, he can't talk me out of that. No, so I'm going to cling to that. Well, I must have got the Holy Spirit and got saved. No, I got the Spirit and I got saved. I got the Holy Ghost after I got saved. Well, yeah, but what after I got the Holy Ghost, I did this and this and messed up with this guy's wife and, and the fruit of the Spirit, you know. So, so oh, well. I, it must be the Holy Ghost. must be the Holy Ghost. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, if it isn't the Holy Ghost, then I got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. And that other spirit was a... Was a oh, 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 no, no, no. He that is born of God does not commit sin. The sin of the man, he counts sin. He's born of God. Greater is he that... That's what happens to those people. Let me tell you something. You got any spirit after you got the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. And you got the Holy Spirit when you got saved. All right? Those things have shape, and they possess. That is an all. They are manifest. By that I mean there are certain ways to spot demon possession. Now, I don't, I don't profess to be any expert in this thing. I don't profess to have been raised up by God in these last days to count all that kind of bunk. But I got good sense. I've been around. I've seen a few things. I was in a church one time up near Batesburg, South Carolina, where a lady had been stepping out with uh, somebody there in the church, and she was the piano player. And the pastor finally called her account for it and was going to get her off the piano bench, where she'd been playing piano for about uh, 10 years. And he asked me to come back in the back room at the time he, you know, gave her the bad news in order to be a witness, so I went back with him. That woman was sitting there, and he told her, you know, we'd have to discharge her and take her off the piano bench. And she sat there, and she said, oh... Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, boy. You never saw such piety in all your life. Oh, dear Jesus. You said there'd be times like this. And oh, after all I've put in this church and all I've done for this church, and now they're crucifying me. <laughs> that old filthy bat. <laughs> Talking about the crucifixion and the blood atonement. And dear Jesus. Question. Why is it that every demon possessed man in the New Testament is a fundamentalist? Why is that? Do you find any man in the New Testament who was demon possessed that didn't believe in the deity of Christ? Show it to me. That woman with divination? Not her. She said, Be the servants of the Most High God that show you the plan of salvation. Not those fellows in Acts 19. They, he said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. 
Not that full of Mark 5. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Demon-possessed people aren't atheists. They're fundamentalists. They believe in the deity of Christ and the virgin birth. Every one of them in that New Testament. Say, Ruckman, you're getting me scared. About time some of you got scared. <laughs> it's about time some began to check what's going on in that noodle and in that body. Some of you folks just go around all day long, just <laughs> make the money here, put it here. <laughs> you never even stop and sit down and think what's going on. You better check up. I believe the air is full of them. I'll be right frank with you. I believe the air is full of them. I remember one time I got in a discussion with a Christian about a certain thing, and in the middle of that thing, that uh, Christian got mad and hauled off and hit me in the face. And I turned my face and said, Try the other side. And they hauled off and hit the other side, and I said, You see there, I got more religion on one side of my face, and you've got on both sides of yours. And that Christian said, Damn you, damn you. And I put my finger up in front of that Christian's face. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you unclean spirit, get out of them. And that Christian hit the floor just like a sack of potatoes. I mean, blop. There wasn't any messing around praying, bring in the candle, bring in the rosary, pray one day. He said, oh, yeah, ma'am. Oh, bring in the little wooden cross. <laughs> well, the devil wears 15 of them around his neck. I ain't going to bother him any. All this... Listen, did you ever find any place in that Bible where it took anybody longer than five seconds to cast out a devil? Show it to me. I did. Going back and praying and then singing and running around the bed and laying on hands. What are you talking about, you kook? In that Bible, every time they cast out of a devil, bam, he's gone. I've seen him, brother. I had a meet one time down in Florida about three years ago, and I just finished preaching the virgin birth. Matter of fact, I preached in the seven mysteries. And you folks that heard the seven mysteries of the day, you know what the first mystery was, was the incarnation. I stood up down here about in the fourth row and said, do you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? And I said, brother, God, not throughout the confusion. And started to say something. He said, but do you confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh? I said, now, brother, he's God called you to preach or me to preach this message, and I'm preaching this one. You preach later. And he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of it. And that guy opened that mouth and couldn't say it, tried to open it again, couldn't say it, and in 10 seconds, two ushers had him by the arms and threw him out the back door. You know what that is? That's a demon trying to give you an orthodox confession of faith. Paul says, we're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his devices. I believe, I believe the air is filled with them. I believe you can't get through a day without getting polluted. I really don't. You take, I heard Copeland, that radio evangelist, say he called the devil an old coon and said, don't worry about him, he can't hurt you. You take Schombach. I like to hear Schombach, you know. He, he's cockeyed, but he preaches. <laughs> uh, he don't know what he's saying, but he's a good preacher. <laughs> And you know, he was prior to him preach the other day. He said, don't you worry about the devil getting a hold of you. He's not a lion anymore. He's just a pussycat. And if he did get a hold of you, he couldn't hurt you. I to myself, oh, boy, don't come around me, man. <laughs> Let me tell you, if a full-grown African lion came through the right now looking for a meal, you wouldn't see me trying to tie a knot in this tail. <laughs> we had a kid come down to our school one time who probably had more promise to be a good preacher, any young fellow we ever had. He had real talent, real ability. Had plenty of nerve, too. Had a lot of courage. Almost too much. And that young fellow came down to our school and wanted to preach, and I knew he wasn't ready yet, but I gave him a chance one night, New Year's Eve, and he preached, made the biggest mess you ever saw. Called one of our best young ladies in the church, a mini-skirted slut, you know, and this and that. His sermon was on the vomiting God. That was his sermon. You know, I'll spew that out of my mouth. <laughs> and he preached every now and then saying, God, go, Ugh! you know, like a real gross message. <laughs> and, and after he got through with that thing, you know, I didn't say nothing to him. I passed in the church two or three times a day and never said boo to him. After about a week, he stopped me and said, well, I really blew it, didn't I? I said, yeah, you sure did. <laughs> and waited about a year, you know, and he wanted to preach again. I knew he wasn't ready. I mean, he's a headstrong, unstable young fellow. Came a broken a home, and as a Yankee on top of that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and after about, you know, after about a year went by, I gave him another chance to preach. And he got up and preached to a big tent meeting and forgot his message right in the middle of the message. Just mine went perfectly blank. And he said, the Bible says, 
the Bible says, and he never did get it. <laughs> and he was so embarrassed, he walked out the back of the tent without finishing the message, put on his uh, worker's helmet, you know, a tin hat, got in the car and went back to Ohio. <laughs> I mean, the same night, just left, you know. He came back about two weeks later. And I let that guy stay in the house with me for a little while. Uh, back in those days, I was a bachelor, and I had young men stay in the other house. I gave him a room over there. I felt sorry for him, gave him a chance, you know. And he was over there one night, and he got making fun of the devil. And I told him, I said, now, John, you're not going to talk like that around here. I'm getting out. And when he saw that gut docked goat, you know, then he had something, you know. If you can impress Brother Ruckman, you know, you've really done something, you know. And he saw that kind of bothered me, so he really poured it on. He began to cuss the devil and call him all kinds of names, make fun of him. And I said, now, buddy, not in the same room. Good night. And I stepped into my room and shut the door. He stayed outside there just having him a big ball. You know what happened to that kid? About a year after he got out of school, they were going to draft him, and he got afraid, wanted to have me ordain him so he wouldn't get drafted. And I wouldn't ordain him because I knew he wasn't ready for the ministry yet. He was only about 20 years old at that time. Matter of fact, I think he was only about 19. He came down to school when he was 16. And uh, then he made a big scene, you know, and he went off the draft board, and all his work was in vain because they wouldn't draft him anyway. He was 65 pounds overweight. And then he really felt bad. And then he came to me and informed me that God had raised him up to expose Ruckmanism. And off he went back to Ohio, and one day when our boys were preaching in the street in downtown Ohio, that fellow came down there and began to rave and to scream and kicked out a plate glass window of a department store right there where they were preaching. And they arrested him, turned him over to his dad. Dad kept him for a while. He came back down to down south, got in the air Fort Atlanta, and his mind left him completely. And somebody got his identification, got his father to come down to Ohio and get him out of the airport and get him back up there to, to Ohio. He went up there and he went in the house of a, my associate pastor, a fellow named Jane McGee. And he got in there one night with Jane McGee and his family, and all of a sudden he began to growl and bend over like this and swing his arm on the floor and slobbered the mouth. And old man McGee, he used to be a boxer, said, you get that door or I'll throw you out. And got him out. That fellow went out to California. He's out in California now sending little tracks around the country about Ruckmanism. At Bob Jones, they pass them out on the campus. I've got three of them sent from Bob Jones. I hope they get hitched up real close. <laughs> Birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> you know what that is? That's demons. That's demons. We used to have a prayer meeting up there at school, and I had a little old shack behind my trailer, and the thing was eight feet square. And you can't imagine a bunch of guys in a shack eight feet square, but in eight feet square, six or seven of us would get there at night and all pray together. We'd all pray at the same time, too. I mean, back in those days, I'd only been saved about, you know, four or five months, and I want everything God had for me, you know. I was praying for the gift of tongues and everything else, you know. I mean, they lay on hands, you know, and blah, 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 that kind of business. We all praying at the same time. One night in that shack, we were all praying at the same time. That place was rocking. And about that time, I noticed one guy was following another guy's prayer. I mean, one guy would pray, Lord, take us out in the street this weekend. The other guy would say, take us out in the street this weekend. And the other guy would say, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. And the other guy would say, fill us with the Holy Spirit. He was listening to that guy's prayer and climbing his prayer. And that went on for about 15 minutes there in the dark. And after it was all over, I followed this guy out of the prayer shack, followed him up the sidewalk of the trailer court, and I stopped him. And I said, now, Jim, I said, uh, uh, God, forgive me if I'm wrong, and forgive me for judging you. I should, probably should have been praying instead of listening to you. But I said, it just seemed to me like, like, like something wrong with you. You're not right. He looked me right straight in the face and said, you're, you're right. He said, I'm not right. And he told me what the trouble was. And it was pretty rough. And I said, well, when you get right, come back to the prayer meeting. So he was gone for two weeks. And after two weeks, he came back to the prayer meeting. Boy, when he came back to the prayer meeting, glory to God, hallelujah, bless the Lord, praise you, Jesus, you know, all that pious stuff. And he came there, and we got in the prayer shack and began to pray. And we got praying again. About that time, I heard him climbing this guy's prayer again just like he'd done before. And he was climbing this guy's prayer, you know, and the guy was saying, and Lord Jesus, wash us in the blood. Lord Jesus, wash us in the blood. And Lord, give us souls for hire. And Lord, give us souls for hire. Climbing the prayer. 
And I started to stop to pray, and about that time we're in the dark, we're real close together, I felt this hand reach out in the dark and laid right on my knee. Now, I wasn't raised. I was drug up. And I got my education in the alleys of a city before I was 10 years old. I remember when I was 10 years old, I went to a theater one time in short pants, air-conditioned theater like it froze me to death. And I sat down there, and some man about 40 years old came in that theater and sat down right next to me and reached out and got a hold of my knee there in the dark. This would be about 19, oh, 32. I always, you know, ran a little ahead of the pack. And he put his hand over there like that, and when he did, I stood up in that seat and yelled, Usher! <laughs> that guy took off like a scalded dog. So I was sitting there in the dark, and this hand comes out, and I put my finger up in that guy's face. I couldn't see who it was, but the face is right in front of me. I must put my finger up with an inch of that bird's nose in the dark. And I said, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out. You know what that fellow prayed? He prayed just like this. And Lord, bless us and you this for your glory. And Father, we just pray that we just might be a blessing to those who receive our gift. Like that. You know what that is? It's demons. <laughs> he sold us that fellow. He was a street preaching independent fundamental missionary, soul winning, double separated, premillennial fundamental Baptist. <laughs> Stuff full of them. Trouble with these Christians, they don't fight. You don't think there's any fight going on. You're just going on. Paying your bills, doing your job, take care of your family, right? Where's your wrestling match? Who are you up against? When was the last time you had a fight? How'd you come out? The Christians don't fight. They quit. It's all right to fight the fundamentalists. I'll tell you, a bigger fight goes on right in here. With the devil, brother. You whip that thing down there, you won't have to worry about the rest. I believe, a demon, I, believe, I believe in demon possession. I believe demons all over the place. I believe this house, this air is filled with them. Did you ever go to an empty church at night after everybody left? You know what that is? When all you folks are right here singing God plays, the band is playing, the preacher is preaching, all that stuff is pushed out. And then after everybody leaves, that stuff comes back in. There's nothing in the world that feels like an empty church building at night where there's been a revival after that. That is the spookiest, man. And folks say you're superstitious. Yeah, I am about those things. I'm just like some of the color brethren, boy, I'll tell you. I don't believe ghosts can hurt you. They make you hurt yourself. <laughs> make you stumble over things trying to get out of the way. You didn't see any colored guys go up to the moon, did you? Did you? Did you see any black folks go to the moon? You know why they didn't go? They got better sense. <laughs> you wouldn't catch me going up there. One of the colored brethren said, he said, I wouldn't mind getting out there. He said, the trouble is I'd pay something to get back in with me. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Folks, so you got the funniest way of looking at things. Yeah, the Bible makes you odd, doesn't it? Now, suppose, let me, I mean, if you're not convinced, I'll get you one way or another. Now, you take this thing right here, suppose I had a short wave set right here, see? And I pick this thing up, and I put it behind me, and I've got Brussels, and I put it around here, and Brussels fades out, and Paris comes in. You take that antenna and put it down like this, and you pick up one station, take it over with your hand, it'll go out, and you get another one. Now, can't you figure that thing out? There's stuff in the air coming through there, and it's going through you. Why don't you doubt it for a minute? You folks have had those kind. Why, do you ever stop thinking what it would be if your mind could pick up right now all the FM and AM stations that are in this room? I'm telling you, man, they're in this room. If you don't believe it, get your battery-operated radio and turn the thing on. It don't come through the plug in the wall. The stuff is in the room. Now, if you know that, why do you doubt what I'm saying? I'll tell you, I think, I think I'm in a, in a demon-infested world. I think there must be 20 miles thick and 40,000 per square foot, as far as I know. I'm a pilgrim. I'm in a foreign country. This isn't my home. 
You take those, you take that thing right there. You know what happens when a kid, I'll get back to this in a minute, but you know what happens when a kid, you know what happens when a kid takes a trip on drugs? You know what happens to him? Well, all he does is break down this thing that God put in here, and he begins to pick up the TV sets and the radio sets. But he doesn't have the right condenser and filter and resistor and rheostat to get the stuff through right. And it comes through part of this program, part of that program, part of this program. Boom, 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 jungle drums. Here's a sheet, checkers, goes over, whoop, checkerboard, slides out the bottom, goes up a tree, frog comes out, railroad train comes down the track, foo, 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 look out, slips off here, whoop, off a cliff, he becomes oil, spreads across the water, whoop, up a tree. You know what he's doing? He's picking up the stuff, but it's all mixed. It's in the air. Fellow says, bad trip. It sure is a bad trip, brother. I thank God I can't pick up all that stuff. You'd go crazy if you could pick up all that stuff. You know what a drunk told me? I mean, he had the DTs for good, man. He'd wake up in the middle of the night and screaming out there on a the bench and police come and get him morphine and tomato juice and cold coffee and all that stuff. I've seen those old mission bums get up at night and sit on those bunks at night and go, ah, ah, like that. You hear him for three blocks. I said, one of those old bums the next night, I said, what are you seeing? He said, Brother P, he said, the snakes, the snakes around those buildings downtown, the big snakes wrapped around all those buildings, and he said, they got hair on them, and he said, they're 10 feet thick. Well, now, somebody says, well, it's the DTs, the bacilli, uh-huh, I know the doctors, what they have to say. Hey, man, do you ever start thinking about this? Maybe he's really saying them. Maybe the guy just gets messing around the liquor, pretty soon he just destroys the stuff up there that prevents you from seeing them, and pretty soon he sees them. You know, Elisha did one time. He took the blind off a guy's eyes, and he saw horses and chariots of fire around about. And they've been there all the time. All right, what does the unclean spirit do? It counterfeits the Holy Spirit. The devil's a great counterfeiter. You read in your Bible about, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed as angel of light. It is no great thing, therefore, that his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The devil's a great counterfeiter. The devil has a counterfeit Bible. The devil has a counterfeit church. Don't you know the devil has a counterfeit Holy Spirit? Why, of course he does. That's his job, to counterfeit. Years ago in this country, there was an evangelist. His name was Rolf Bonnard. He's dead and gone now. He was a hyper-Calvinist. First time I ran into him, I was up at Bob Jones going to school up there. And I, a bunch of young preachers were going out every weekend in the street and preaching, winning people to Christ. And some of them had been doing it with me for a couple of years. And one day, Rolf Bonnard came to town. And when Rolf Bonnard came down, he came to town to a fellow named B.B. Caldwell, whose church is in Greenville, South Carolina, and he had a meeting down there. And all of a sudden, the strangest things began to happen in that meeting. All of a sudden, all the guys have been winning souls and preaching the street. Suddenly, all of them began to get saved. And some have been preaching for years. And finally, my song leader, an old boy named Bob Person, said, maybe we ought to go down and hear that fellow. I said, yeah, maybe we should, man. This really is something. All these guys getting saved. They've been winning souls for years. Bob Person was six feet three, weighed 320 pounds. He was my song leader. And he'd stick going through some of those doors back there. And he, he might have been, not have been dumb as an ox, but he wasn't much smarter. But that old boy loved the Lord, and he, had, he wasn't much on Bible, but he's great on prayer. He'd pray all night. And so we went down to hear this fellow preach. And we went down to hear this fellow preach, and I had a young fellow standing next to me that had been preaching the street with me for several years. And uh, Barnard preached his message. Now, I must confess, I thought it was a good message. I enjoyed it. He exalted Christ. He really exalted Christ. I mean, he raised Christ way up, magnified him. Matter of fact, you know, he had him so high that uh, sometimes you got the impression maybe you couldn't reach him. But he had him magnified. And when he got to the invitation, you know what he did? He bent over that pulpit and he said, Well, I don't know whether God will save you or not. I don't know whether you're one of the elect or not, but if you think you are and you think God might do business with you, come down just as I am without one plea. And this guy standing next to me, young preacher, began to shake, tremble from head to foot. And he turned to me and said, let's go down. I said, what for? He said, I just feel like I ought to go down and pray. I said, well, go on. 
And he said, well, come on with me. I said, what for? I don't need nothing to pray about. I'm all prayed up. <laughs> and he said, well, I just feel like i got to pray. I said, well, pray, man. He dropped on his knees right by me and began to pray. Well, we hadn't got back to school. That guy professed that he'd just gotten saved. And going back to the school in the car, I turned to Bob Person, my song leader, and I said, uh, what did you think about that service? Just give me your opinion of it. And Bob's face was white. And he said, well, didn't you know, Brother Pete? He said, didn't you notice that, that service was just like a funeral? And I never thought about it until he said that. But when he said that, I looked back, I said to myself, that's just what it was like. It was like a funeral. There was a power there, but it was a strange power. And there was truth there, but it was a, it was a cold. It was a dead. It was a killing thing. You know something, the next month, three of those guys that had been out street preaching with me showed up and claimed they'd just gotten saved. They all had one thing in common. Every one of them quit the ministry and quit winning the souls to Christ after they got saved. One of them came around to me, and I knew he was really way out in the back end of the woods, and I turned him into the university. The university said, if you know somebody doing something wrong here, there'll be a threat to the university, you don't turn them in, you're a traitor. So I went and turned the guy in. He came out to me the next day after they shipped him, and he said, well now, Brother Pete, I know you did what you thought was right, and I know you think you're doing right, but I want to have you know, brother, that I just praise God, and I trust I'm one of the elect. Something wrong with the voice. Something wrong with the eyes. The Bible says, out of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. The Bible says, the light of the body is the eye. Well, Brother Pete, he wouldn't look me in the eye. I kept looking at my nose. Wouldn't look me in the eye. And I said, uh, Chet, I said, are you saying, well, I hope I'm one of the elect. I said, listen, boy, I said, if I was you knowing about hell, what I know about hell, I wouldn't even be standing here talking to me. <laughs> I said, if I was your shoes knowing what I know about hell, I'd be in a closet someplace getting saved. I wouldn't walk out the door till I knew I was saved. I mean, you might slip in a banana peel and break your fool head and wake, neck and wake up in hell, you know that? fellow stand worrying about whether he's one of the elect. Are you wondering whether you're one of the elect tonight? Get on that thing there and make your election and calling sure. <laughs> Brother, all this stuff waiting, sitting around waiting for God to elect you. You know what that fellow had? He had a demon. You know what kind of demon that was? That was a theological demon. That was a doctrinal demon. Years ago in this country, there was a great bishop named Bishop Pike. And when Bishop Pike uh, got saved and called to preach, if he did get saved and called to preach, he took the vows in his church. And the vows in his church state that he's to defend the church against all doctrinal heresies and everything that's against the book, the Word of God. And that hypocrite got on his feet like most hypocrites these days and took his ordination vows. He didn't believe one word of his vows. And after he got uh, grown up, his father-in-law began to have trouble with a haunted house. And they moved out. And then one of his nephews or somebody began to see operations in graveyards. And finally his son committed suicide. And when his son committed a suicide, the clock on the wall in the house they were staying stopped at the hour where the boy committed suicide. And Bishop Pike went to some seance, some palmist readers and uh, phrenologists and this and that, and some necromancers to try to contact his dead son. And about that time he was highly encouraged by a Roman Catholic who told him that he'd been true to his religion. At about that time one of the high Whigs in his own church told him that God had chosen him to write a work greater than Luther's thesis. And about that time, he began to fool with unclean spirits and things, and put us in the books in his house, began to lie at 140 degrees on the, on the mantel. And finally, he began to contact his dead son, and he finally got contact with his dead son. And when he got contact with his dead son, you know what his dead son said? His dead son said, Daddy, I'm in a place kind of like hell, but it's not hell. And he said, Down here we're learning and paying for our mistakes. And he said, we learn here that Jesus Christ didn't die to save anybody. He was just a great example, he said. And he said, down here, at least there's nobody trying to cram Jesus down your throat. You know what that is? That's an unclean spirit. Bishop Pike went over to the Holy Land to find his son. Some medium told him he'd find him over there, a medium or something. And that fellow got out there in a kind of a desert place, in the Judean desert, and pretty soon he, he was late getting back and his wife began to inquire what happened to him 
And one of the mediums told her through the Spirit that your husband is not very far off. He's just a little bit sick, and he's just a few hundred yards off. He wasn't a few hundred yards off. He was two miles off. And he wasn't sick. He was dead. But that fellow did. He gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. He's a Methodist bishop. Methodist bishop. You know what J.B. Phillips said? J.B. Phillips said, one night when I was watching my television set, I turned around and there was C.S. Lewis sitting next to me, just as pink and rosy and good health as I ever saw him. And we had fellowship all evening. C.S. Lewis had been dead for five years. You know who that guy was that said he had fellowship with him? He's the translator of Phillips' translation that you hear Dr. Theodore Epp referring to sometimes. You know what you got? You got a nation full of Christians that are just crawling with demons. I don't know where you're getting yours from, but boy, they're in the air. They're in the air. You know, you say now, what am I going to do about this thing? Well, I'll tell you what I do, and you think I'm crazy. It's a free country. I think some of you are kind of kooky, too. We can get along. You tolerate me, I'll tolerate you. I'll tell you what I do. First of all, I pray. And I say, Lord, there's a good possibility I'm demon-possessed. <laughs> there's plenty enough of them around. And then I pray and say, Lord, I want all the devil's lies destroyed to me. If I'm believing one thing that isn't so, I want you to show me where I'm deceived. If I'm being fooled anywhere, if I'm fooling myself about something about me that's true, I want the truth on it. If it comes from an enemy, okay, I'll take it. I don't want to be deceived. And then you know what I do? I cast out my own devils. I wouldn't pay an exorcist to do the job for me. I wouldn't pay $30 an hour to some shrink, you know, to sit around there and try to get rid of them. I mean, I go to bed at night, and I say, now you unclean spirits, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of me. <laughs> me. I say, Lord, I plead the blood. I want you devils and demons washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jehovah God, you foul, unclean spirit, get out and leave me alone. Folks say you're crazy. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it winds up, who's crazy and who's not. You know what you better do? Some of you Christians, some of you Christians, you better go home and clean up some of that crap you got in your house. You know that? Some of that garbage in the corner? Some of that garbage in the bookshelf? Some of that garbage in the magazine rack? Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Down there in Panama City, Florida, one time I had a meeting and a guy called me back in the prayer room one night after the service and he said, uh, I'm in bad trouble. He said, my home is about to break up. And he said, I'm a Christian, and I'm saved. My wife is saved, at least the way she professed to be. And he said, she'd been running around with this uh, naval air cadet down here, pilot training, stepping out on me. And he said, I've been praying, and God's been dealing with me about my sins. I've been a good husband, and I've been smoking. But he said, these are the last package you're ever going to smoke. He gave it to me. He said, I'm through tonight. And he said, I've got to do something about my wife. What shall I do? He told me, he said, every other night about 11 o'clock, she gets out of bed and goes out of the house. She thinks I'm asleep, but I'm not. I hear her go. And sometimes she doesn't come in until about 5 or 6 in the morning. And I said, of course, you understand, premillennial, so well, independent, fundamental, Bible, all that stuff, you know. And I said, I'll tell you what you do. I said, next time she goes out, I said, uh, you just pray all night. And be praying when she comes back in the morning. He did it. And the next night, about 10 o'clock, he got out of bed and went in the living room, knelt down on his knees, began to pray. And when he got praying down there, about 11 o'clock, she came through there on her way out, and she turned in the light to find something she'd forgotten, and saw him kneeling over there with the sofa, and she said, what are you doing? He said, I'm praying. She laughed and said, about what? He said, about you. And she said, oh, and laughed and walked out the door. She was back in an hour and a half. And when she came back in, she was soaking wet, just from head to foot, and lily pads all over, hanging off her clothes. <laughs> and that woman had taken off and gone somewhere, and some car come by a bunch of people trying to mug her and ran her off the road. And she got out and ran for her life and ran through about three backyards and fell in somebody's fish pond, <laughs> and then came in like that. <laughs> well, that thing all went along like that for about two or three months. And she didn't straighten up. 
And that guy wept and prayed and wept and prayed and wept and prayed and wept and prayed. And boy, one day in Panama City, downtown, they heard a big old explosion like something breaking the sound barrier. And that old plane, that a uh, pilot trainer was in, went over that city at about 20,000 feet and blew up in the air. I mean, exploded. They found 25 pounds of his body and put that stuff in a box and mailed it back to California to his kinfolk. And that train went out west, heading back to California with that stuff in the baggage car. That woman, that guy's wife, was in the car right ahead of the baggage car, dressed in black, and rode that train all the way back to California with that corpse. You know what that is? It's demons! <laughs> we had a guy in this country play the guitar. And some of you folks thought he was a Christian. And that fellow laughed at funerals and liked to hang around morgues and claim the power of healing. He used every four-letter cuss word in the English language except for the public could hear it. That old boy died, they said it's a long way from Graceland to heaven. It sure is. If that fellow was saved, he was crawling with them all his life. And if he was saved, I whether he was or not, that fellow was a dean possessed as you can get without falling to hell. When that guy died, he had hardening the arteries at 39 years old. Demon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless the message tonight. Bless your people tonight. Lord, if there's somebody in this building tonight that isn't saved or doesn't know they're saved, help them to make sure tonight. May they not be deceived. May they not be deceived by any man. Let no man deceive them. You said these things. I love these people. If I've been hard with them, it's because they needed it. They're like sheep. It just breaks a heart sometimes to see how stupid they are. They just wander around and get lost and stray, and wolves get them, and eagles get them, and lions eat them up. And maybe they, some of them have a good heart, Lord. They mean well, and they want to do right. But they're just dumb, and they're deceived, and you told them not to be deceived. Now, Lord, I pray might open their eyes. Now, let's remain in prayer a few minutes. Head bowed back there, and eyes shut. Now, pray. And say, Lord, if I'm kidding myself about something, give me some light. Say, Lord, if there's something in my life that needs to go and I'm not getting rid of it, help me get rid of it. Say, Lord, if I'm telling myself a little story over and over again and using an alibi and it isn't right, then give me another story. But get the devils out of me. Say, Lord, I don't want to have anything to do with the devil. I don't want anything to do with demons. I want to be a clean vessel. I want to be a pure vessel. Fit for the master's use. Say, Lord, if there are any devils in me, I want them out. Come on, admit there's a possibility. I bet some of you folks never even faced the, the reality that there might be a possibility. I don't say you're all demon-possessed. I don't say any of you are demon-possessed. But there's always that possibility. Now allow for it. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. And we plead for wisdom. You said if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And Father, for somebody in this building who doesn't know they're saved, may they not leave this building tonight till they know they're saved. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand here tonight. Now, it's pretty late, and I've been pretty long-winded, but I think we ought to give a, a few stands of invitation tonight. I like to have a sing, uh, I Can Hear My Savior Calling, uh, Where He Leads Me, I'll Follow. If you have that in the book, what number is that, brother? Where he leads me, I'll follow. I can hear my Savior calling. If you're a Christian here tonight, you know down your heart you've been living a kind of an unclean life, kind of an impure life. Why don't you come down tonight and spend a little time here in prayer and make a little vow of dedication at this altar and say, now, from now on, Lord, I want to be, I want to be cleaner than I've been. I don't want to be dirty inside. Some of you folks clean outside and inside isn't clean. Isn't clean. We all have some trouble with it, don't we? You take this country, this country has pictures on billboards now, on the highway, that couldn't have gotten this country without an act of Congress 50 years ago. When I was a boy, they took a magazine called Ken Magazine, and they put it out of business and bankrupted it because one issue had an article recommending prostitution. 
You've got 20 magazines today that glamorize it and advertise it, and none of them are going out of business. You live, listen, people, you're living in a filthy age, in a filthy environment, in a filthy country. And if you want God to use you, get the devils out of you and keep them out of you. 290. 290. Let's turn to 290 in the hymnal, hymn 290. We'll sing three stanzas, that's all, three stanzas. One other invitation. If you're here tonight, you don't know for certain you're saved, come on down the front, let somebody deal with you, have prayer with you, all right? All right, let's sing. That's all right, brother, come ahead. Well, let's I can hear, hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. If you don't know you're saved, I come on, while we say. Take thy cross. Where he leads me, I'll follow. Somebody else tonight. Somebody else tonight. How about some of you want to say people? You see, brethren, you see, brethren, we can talk about standards and principles and consecration to a red, white, and blue. And if it isn't a daily, hourly battle, it doesn't do any good at all. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight. Fight. And don't spend all your time fighting the brethren, fighting your wife, <laughs> fighting your husband. <laughs> fight. Fight the devil. He wants you. He's after you. The devil liked nothing better to do than to sink this church. Nothing better than he'd like in that. You got the thing going now. You love the Lord. You're relaxed. You believe the book. You're enjoying your salvation. You're learning something. You're affecting the town. The Catholics are mad at you. The Charismatics are mad at you. The Calvinists are mad at you. Your kin folks are mad at you. You're getting something done. Now the devil liked nothing better than just to stop you dead. Don't let him do it. Fight, fight. Let's sing another stanza. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him. Oh, Where he leads me, I'll follow. spend all your time fighting other religion. Now, you've heard me say a good bit against the Catholic Church here in these meetings. I do that because you need to hear it. But I don't waste my time fighting the Catholic Church. When I was downtown day preaching, that Catholic woman was telling me to shut up. You know what I told her when I got through? I said, God bless you, sister. <laughs> and I smiled at her. That'll do more damage than anything. <laughs> don't spend all your time just fighting and fighting, you know, other things. The big fight is right here. The big flesh is the world and the flesh and the devil. I've been talking tonight about spiritual warfare, the devil, the devil. One more stand, we're going to close. Now listen, before we sing, of any unsaved people here tonight, if, if what I've told you, now you've got your own opinion, maybe I can't convince you, if what I've told you right, you see what you're up against? You're going to get to heaven living a good life, are you? In that kind of an environment? Listen, there are forces at work on you. There have been forces at work on some of you folks while I've been talking. But have been between my mouth and your ear while I've been talking here. How are you going to win the fight without Jesus Christ? You can't do it. You can't do it. Are you deceived about your salvation? I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I'm not like Rolf Barnard. I don't teach if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all. He's not Lord at all. I don't teach that. I know Christians can be a long way from having Christ the Lord of their life and still be saved. But don't you kid yourself. 
Don't you stand back there and say, well, I know I'm saved because I feel like it or because, uh, you know, I had an experience one time. This, You make sure you're resting on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not sure, come on down and make sure. The person the work is here will be ready to deal with you. Last stand, the last chance. While we sing, come on, brother. Brother, lead us. He will give me grace and glory. This will be it. He will give the Lord deal with you. Come on. And glory. If you haven't he got it settled, give get it settled. Me grace and glory. And go with me, with me all the way. Get it settled. Let no man deceive you. Where it is, may I follow. Let no man deceive himself. Be not deceived. for sure we have got a battle on our hands and we choose to ignore that sometimes the Bible still says we wrestle not against flesh and blood it's an amazing thing well I appreciated that message man I can see a lot of truth in that thing it's right out of the book no one even see truth in it Turn me down. If you doubt what uh, Dr. Ruckman was talking about tonight, well, it's it's real. If you doubt that they're real and they're around, you just you don't know. You've chosen to be ignorant. Matter of fact, you come around here some night, you just give me a call and I'll meet you here about 12 o'clock some night. And I'll just unlock the door and we'll leave the lights off and I'll tell you where to go. I'll give you a little road map through this place. You check it out for yourself. I've hit a few spots going through these buildings alone at night. When I wanted to hit a dead run. And I'm not afraid of the dark. It wasn't the dark. It wasn't the dark. It's what lives in the dark. Yeah, that's, that's a real deal. Let me say one thing else before we pray and we go. Some of you folk are baby Christians and you're new and... You had a whole brand new revelation put before you tonight. And let me tell you something. I, I, I know what I'm talking about. We've got some new folk before you were saved, right up to the day you were saved, maybe to this day, you were messing around with some stuff you better burn. Some of you are messing around with some cards and messing around with some Ouija boards and messing around with some astrology and messing around with some horoscopes and you ought to just burn that stuff. Amen. You ought to get rid of it. Because I'm here to tell you, you got problems if you don't. You just, that's a whole other message, but get rid of it. Get rid of it. Well, amen, I'll tell you, that was certainly informative. Tomorrow night, men, 7.30. Amen. amen. Let's pray, shall we? Brother Tom Corwin, pray for us, please.